uh, as a moderating function. Uh, there is a Q&A section. There's an opportunity to raise hands uh, and otherwise. So we do have Ryan Cathers, who is our uh, North American sales manager with our firm. He will be helping to field questions as we go. So feel free to pop those up and we'll get back to those by the end. Uh, also, we will be having a polling question at the end about your specific situation, the urgency of the specific situation, uh, and obviously how quickly we can assist. And there will be the opportunity for a consultation uh, individually with, uh, with each and every one who specifically requested. Okay, so a little bit about Cirrus. And I, I mention this only because it is pertinent. We have seen this through September 11th as we were founded in 1994 by dentists for dentists, principally due to the fact that dentists were graduating through dental school without any significant business level experience. So we've seen this in 2001, then again in 2008. And while this is absolutely unprecedented, there is a lot of hallmarks to the opportunities that have arisen back to 2008 when we went through a large, um, adjustment in the market uh, and in the economy. So principally, again, we were founded to help guide doctors through this, to be the guiding hand, to help deal with the large corporations of the landlords, to help represent the doctor in the negotiation of the business, legal, right, and financial terms of the lease agreement. So we've now done over 12,000 successful lease negotiations. We are the only healthcare tenant representation firm of our kind in North America. We work with over 500 doctors annually from new doctors opening their very first practice to purchasing their very first um, practice or acquiring their first practice to mid-career doctors that have now just been successfully in paying off their student loan and practice debt right, and are now just getting to be um, you know, putting some significant assets in place and looking at personal guarantees and other components of the lease. So we work with mid-career dentists. Uh, also working with transitioning dentists. So this economic change and challenge is going to have a significant impact for many of you on this line that are looking to sell your practice in the next five to 10 years. So we'll touch on strategies on that as well. So again, today is not about feeling helpless or, or alone. Today is the opportunity to have a feeling of strength and a clear action plan to take today to rather than waiting until missing, heaven forbid, missing a payment in April or, or waiting for the landlord to submit a, a letter under your, uh, under your office door stating that even though you're closed, you still owe us rent as one of our uh, clients sent us earlier today. So in addition to that, we are delivering hundreds of these continuing educations per year, uh, as well as we're accredited by the Academy of General Dentistry. And of course, we speak in booth at many of the larger shows uh, very, very saddened to see that the, uh, the hall, uh, Javid Hall that we were at not long ago with Bank of America and, and others that we had at the Greater New York. So where we were presenting for the Greater New York Dental Show is now a community hospital for 25,000 infected people in New York. So those of you joining us from Manhattan, we, we hear you. We're happy to assist, and we certainly understand that uh, you know where these concerns are coming from. Uh, and the Yankee was not that long ago, just as we were starting to see the the ramp up. So now, doctors, I wanted to start with three numbers: eighty-five, fifty-four, and eighty. Eighty-five represents the number of dentists that have a lease that can prevent them from ever selling their practice. So this pertains to the assignment clause where the landlord has the control as to if or when you can assign your practice and you cannot assign your practice without the landlord's prior written approval. 54, 54% of dentists across North America are overpaying in rent. I would argue this number has increased dramatically as now vacancies are starting to rise, right? Landlords are becoming incredibly interested in new tenants or renegotiating leases at more favorable rents versus all the other tenants, the nail salons, the haircuts, or the, the bars that lost all their revenue from St. Patty's Day that are reaching out and having very, very concerning conversations with your landlords today. And last but not least, 80% of landlords structure the lease 
that give the landlord the right to at least 50% of the proceeds when the practice is sold. That's known as a consideration clause, which we'll also reference today. So the purpose of today, doctors, is a fewfold. Number one is let's talk about today. Right, let's talk about rent and operating expense obligations. Let's talk about strategies and let's start hopefully turning off the news, thinking negative, right? And let's start thinking about how we can come out of this on the far side stronger and better than ever, right? But we need to first be planning for the best, but we also need to be prepared for the worst. If production does not resume back to normal circumstances, in 60 days from now, doctors, do you have the cash reserves in place? Is your burn rate such that you're protected that you can weather the storm without having to be in default of your lease, without missing payments, or making your situations much, much worse? Current economic climate. So we're going to be joined by our managing partner in a moment, specifically discuss discussing where we're at what that means for you, the dental community, and your specific practice, as well as the macroeconomic climate on its own. We're also going to be spending some significant time talking about what is keeping us up at night, which is cash flow management, payroll, and rent. In addition to that, we will be recording today's session to ensure that many of you have the opportunity to see this later on. And for those of you that are unable to join or uh, we're capped due to the limitation of over 500 attendees. We will be doing a second one of these coming up on, on the first. Uh, in addition to that, we're going to talk to John payroll, rent, and talking about what to look out for. What's the financial and non-financial components within the lease agreement? In addition to that, we're also then going to be looking on strategies. What to do before picking up the phone and talking to the landlord. And please don't just after this, after this, uh, after you hang up today, don't just pick up the phone and call the landlord. You must know what your obligations are and what your lease looks like. Uh, and then last but not least, right, it's an unprecedented opportunity for new leases or for those coming up to renewals. So it's my pleasure to introduce our managing partner, Mr. Alan Saba, who has been lecturing throughout North America uh, for the past over 10 years now as Cirrus, has also been responsible for many of our large partnership uh, agreements and is, is one of the foremost experts as it comes to dental office lease negotiations throughout North America. Thank you, Eric. Um, again, thank you all for joining us today um, for this short webinar. And so Eric has asked me to just give uh, an opinion on what's happening. And so I don't think there's a need for any of us to further dwell on what's happening with COVID because I think the world is intimately aware that we are absolutely going through an unprecedented time, uh, healthcare as a whole and particularly dentistry. Over the last uh, two to three weeks, doctors, the, the situation continues to unfold uh, by the minute and unfortunately, it seems to be getting worse as time is progressing with um, more, more of the Western world moving into self-isolation and self-quarantine and a real effort um, to try to contain the virus and flatten the curve, as they say. So ultimately, you know, what, what's happened um, over the last 30 days has been a very, very dramatic and serious impact to global economy, um, Europe, the United States, Canada, etc., um, tremendous volatility in the market, stock market. And um, what we're finding is that the governments are reacting daily to, you know, what's happening in the world. And so what uh, unfortunately we're finding is occurring is that as stimulus now is being injected into the economy, really, you know, short-term measures in an efforts to stave off what, what I would argue and believe to be an imminent recession and a real need for small business owners, um, particularly dental practitioners in this particular case, to really pay close attention to really doing two things really well. Number one, to expense controls and um, managing your expenses really well. And Eric will speak at length um, on you know, what to do with the landlord and what the next steps are. 
but the rent, the expense controls go further. Um, I've been advising doctors over the last week or so, for those of you that have debt, um, to contact your lender and to work on a deferral plan with your lenders. And the good news, doctors, is that you know most of the lenders that I've been in discussions with, um, Bank of America, some of the others, are have been very willing to figure out how to help um, all of us get through this trying time. So. For those of you that are on the webinar that have debt obligations, um, please contact your lender and um, get into a conversation about deferrals or holidays of principal and interest so that we can basically get through, call it the next 30 to 90 days. Um, obviously, your, your, your rental payments and obligations, Eric will speak about at length. Um, and number two is patient communications. So the one thing that I've heard um, resoundedly from doctors across both the United States and Canada over the last week or so is that very regular and frequent patient communications are essential now. Um, whether you're doing it through your practice management software, Recall Max, any of the, the platforms that enable you to speak to your patients, um, take a very open approach to speaking with them and making sure they understand that yes, your practice may be closed, um, may be open to emergency services only, but, but great patient communications are essential in this time. I think that uh, one of the things that gives us great concern is the impact to just business in general. And everybody has been reading the same papers and watching the same news that we have that there are unprecedented, uh, unprecedented numbers of layoffs and uh, job eliminations, if you will, tremendous amounts um, of, of workers that are applying for employment insurance or benefits, if you will. And so we, you know, very difficult to provide, say, economic opinions, given the fact that we're, we're, what we're experiencing now is nothing like what we've experienced in the past. And that the best advice that we're giving our clients is to, you know, manage your, your costs as well as you can, um, be very good from a patient communication point of view. And you know, there, there will be an end to this, doctors. There's no doubt. We, we're, we're optimistic that there will be uh, a, a, an end to this. We just have to get through um, a period of time of real uncertainty. And number two, um, let's just say hypothetically that there is a vaccine that gets found in 90 days and the problem goes away. Uh, I don't expect that business is going to get back to normal when, when we come out of this. I think that there will be a very long and, and, and slow recovery. Um, I think that, that the consumer and the disposable income that the consumer had is going to be greatly impacted by this. And so, you know, whether or not patients are going to be willing to buy Invisalign or place implants or do cosmetic or aesthetic dentistry, I think that when we come out of this, that we should all anticipate a slow recovery and a different uh, dental landscape, regardless of what part of the country you're in um, and, and what percentage of your business is fee-for-service versus insurance or HMO, PPO, that, that you know, the phases, if you will, are phase one, we have to get out of the mess we're in. Uh, phase two is a slow recovery. And then phase three is you know, a new sense of normalcy and quite frankly, I don't believe that that will occur in 2020. I think that, that the damage that's been done to the economy, to capitalism, to business, I think will take uh, quite some time, unfortunately, to fix. And uh, you know, the, the availability of debt, if you will, by banks and by government, while good for the short term to help us all get through this, not necessarily good for the long term in the sense that as a small business owner, um, you know, the, the, the creation or the addition of debt to your balance sheets is not necessarily the greatest thing, but unfortunately a necessary evil. Um, impact to dentistry, I think that, you know, what I've experienced in the last week is that clinics are either closing up completely uh, and, and adhering to the associations or the, the, the state's regulatory um, recommendations on offering emergency services only and so the consensus, I think, in my mind is that, you know, the doctors that are electing to remain open in these times have seen production and collections drop by 70, 80, 90%. And so 
the, the, the mission, quite frankly, doctors over the next 90 days is to try to manage cost as well as you can and to try to not incur a tremendous amount of debt to allow you to get through, call it the next 60 to 90 days. I think that uh, to my earlier points, the recovery, uh, once we're past this first phase, we should anticipate a, a, a very different new normal um, where I think patients are going to really do what it is that is essential to be done. And any of the elective or aesthetic or cosmetic work, um, I think that that revenue stream will suffer when we come out of this. So I think that overall, as much as I hate for my, my opinions to sound negative, uh, I'm a consummate optimist. I think that the, the profession is uh, very safe. I think that we will come out of this. We have to be optimistic and positive. But the, the purpose really, I think, as I turn back to Eric to talk about the rent obligations and occupancy costs, et cetera, are principally about how best to speak to the landlords about an amicable solution during this period of uncertainty, which is where I think that uh, the team at Cirrus can do a great job with. And so that being said, I'll turn back to Eric. Great. Thank you, Alan. Uh, just as a quick side note for the other 40 doctors who just recently joined over the last few minutes, uh, there is a Q&A section that you can access through your mobile apps as well as through the web pages. Uh, we do have Ryan Kaler's, our manager of uh, healthcare, uh, healthcare leasing here at Cirrus. So happy to answer those as we go through. So, all right, so now we know where we're at. Before we talk about how we can get a solution, let's talk about what a lease is. And for those of you that may have attended our courses or lectures throughout North America, we've always asked this question, what is it? What does it mean to us? And now more than ever, we need to understand what it is. And for the uh, three or four of you that are joined in over the phone, what we're looking at here is a check. It's a check. The lease, if nothing else, the first half of the first page, which unfortunately is what 95% of doctors just focus on in their lease negotiations is the check. Who does it go to? How often is it paid? Right? What is the total financial obligations? How much does it increase every year? And whom is responsible? Yourself personally or your corporation? And for those of you that may not know if the lease is in your corporation or in your name personally, now more than ever, that becomes relevant because that may have unknowingly exposed yourself and personal assets to the lease. So it represents the largest check that you spend to any individual entity during your personal or professional lives. Most of you are five, 10, 15, 20 plus years into the same space. Recent stats have shown about 26 years, the average dental practice stays as a tenant, either with themselves or if the practice is sold. So, now, why? Why is the lease so important during where we're at now with COVID-19? So, first of all, one of the mo most important components here is that your office location is the fundamental of your practice, right? Imagine tomorrow if the landlord goes bankrupt or if you walk up and you turn your key and the key doesn't work and there's a small brown envelope on your, on your location that says you no longer have access. What impact would that have to you, to your business? Who would you call? What would you do? These are the type of questions, while as, as horrific as they may sound, we get these phone calls when exactly this type of thing happens. So the lease arguably is one of the most important aspects to your practice. It either creates a rock solid conc concrete foundation to build your, build your business upon or a crumbling shell that could cost tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars down the road if the landlord was to require you to relocate the premises to a different aspect in the building if you have a relocation clause or throughout many and many, many of the urban centers if you're required to and the landlord has a demolition right to terminate your lease within 30 or 60 days. I can't stress this enough. The biggest theme and takeaway from today is failure to pay rent can be catastrophic. We will touch base on all the default provisions that may be in your lease that I'm sure you never looked at through the process, but that could be most relevant. So heaven forbid, if we miss April 1st, 
I read a lease yesterday that if it's seven days after April 1st and payment is not received, then there can be a large, the equivalent of three months rent is now required instantly due to requiring an additional security deposit. So, so doctors, please do not just uh, hold back or wait, right? The time for action is now. The investment. So feel good about your position with the landlord. You represent the best possible resource and the best possible tenant to that landlord. Think about it. You spend the most than any other commercial real estate tenant on the planet. Right? You're building out practices, beautiful practices for $200, $250 per square foot, right? medical grade plumbing, medical grade electrical. Right? It could not be more important and more expensive to build. So we can't just relocate, right? but it also represents a huge benefit to the landlord because all that money that you took the loan out and built out that space or acquired the space, right? if not defined, all fixtures, with the exception of trade fixtures, are deemed ownership of the landlord. Uh, within that fact, right, it can be very expensive to build. We had a doctor reach out to us not long ago that because of a photo of her front door, right, discussing the hours of operation, the landlord and their team found a loophole in the lease and required her to relocate that practice, all because of the fact that a Starbucks wanted that beautiful corner location with lots of natural light. So the relocation and to pick up and move can be devastating, especially in times like today. Right? The practice sale we'll touch on. The practice sale, again, if things get bad and there's a shift and you're either on the acquiring side or if you're on the selling side, the lease will dictate if or how you're able to sell your practice. And lastly, you have leverage. I know it doesn't feel that way, especially right now, but you are right, an ideal tenant. You represent less than a 0.5% default rate to landlords. You're typically in that property for the long period of time. You are an ideal tenant. So that's how we need to frame today's discussion and start answering your questions as I see a lot more coming through on the Q&A section here. So what should the lease do for you? Well, now more than ever, it has to be fair and affordable financial terms. Well, that's the million dollar question as to what FAIR is. Luckily, a lot of our proprietary real estate software gives us very accurate and updated data. And with all the active lease negotiations we have going on throughout North America, we can now quickly see that landlords are being more open than ever for to fill their vacant properties or to also entertain long-term lease renewals. Because if you've been reading some of the news this morning, these large REITs now have a significant fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. They also have major mortgage payments to make, right? They're also now responsible for making sure that, you know, they come out of it on the far side and let alone their own specific other uh, debt or other types of obligations. So again, that is ideal. Also long-term stability and security. If any of you have a month to month lease today or about to expire in the near future, there's a poll at the end critical that you select, yes, my situation is urgent, right? And, and important that we can prioritize those because if you are month to month, that is a major red flag and you could be deemed in holdover status per your lease, which might require your lease payment to increase by 150 or 200%. We'll, more, we'll touch on that shortly, but you want ideally a new 10-year term with two five-year option or as long of a term as possible to ensure consistency and continuity for your practice. Minimizing risk and exposure. We'll spend more time on this today, but it's very important that again, especially for some that are renewing their leases, things like a death and disability clause that may give you an early termination right that heaven forbid something happened to you or your ability to practice wet finger dentistry gives you the flexibility or your estate to be able to terminate the lease and be absolved of that liability. There was a doctor north of our office that unfortunately, after building at a beautiful six operatory practice at 43 years of age, three weeks prior to the grand opening, had passed away due to a massive heart attack. 
fully built out practice, no patients, no goodwill, no doctor. What's that practice worth? Unfortunately, zero. Where now the estate and the wife was now responsible for the almost $10,000 a month increasing at 4% per year for the remaining nine and a half years. So the reason why I personally get so passionate and I'm willing to spend morning, noon, and night supporting the dental community is because of this. Had that doctor been professionally represented in these times of hardship that we never thought would happen to us, right? that could have given his estate such a, a wealth of, of freedom and flexibility and taken away such a terrible onus at that time of need. So that's why I get so passionate personally about requiring that landlords are not taking advantage of the dental tenants and that they're all getting the proper representation and the proper guidance through the negotiations. You want as much flexibility as possible throughout the lease, as well as to protect yourself when you eventually go to sell your practice. So now as we look into phase two of today's webinar, and I want to allow for some time for some good Q&A, uh, which you can see some of the questions um, in your, uh, in your uh, Q&A section to your app, is let's talk about cash flow. So as Alan alluded to, burn rates, right? What do we have in reserve? What do we have for upcoming expenses? Payroll and rent are principally the number one and number two costs. Then, of course, you have all your merchandise and you have your everything that the dental supply partners have been providing you. But rent and payroll, those ones are fixed for the most part, which is why many of you have gone to the unbelievable step to have to lay off. But it was necessary. I received a call from a doctor in Manhattan recently that said, I cannot make payroll and rent. And I need help reaching out to the landlord to state that it is in the landlord's best interest for me to pay my staff and to get some abatement or deferrals in rent in alignment with helping to make sure my staff uh, stay employed and ready to go once we get through this in phase two, as Alan was referring to. So within that, let's touch on rent and therefore the lease obligations. Doctors, if you have not looked at your lease recently, and if many of you are flipping through your digital archives as we speak, very important you get that ready and have that reviewed and you're aware of what your obligations are. Principally, they're broken down into financial and non-financial. Let's talk about financial first. So base rent, the landlord, as all landlords do, make it that regardless of what happens, regardless of a force majeure, regardless of pandemics, the responsibility in all your leases are that you will continue and be required to pay base rent. There may be some exceptions, but principally that is where the landlord usually makes sure that that is their absolute requirement. So base rent is one of the major financial components, which we'll touch on with strategies on how to deal with that. The next one is common area maintenance fees, right? This is now a big question. Is the landlord, the landlord still required to pay property taxes, right? Is the landlord incurring less or more expenses if they're enhancing their cleaning? services, right? Some of you may actually be getting an increased common area maintenance next month purely because of the fact of COVID-19 and they've had to increase security, they've had to change hours, there are less tenants, right? There's a whole bunch of aspects here that we need to be very, very cautious about and we need to understand our obligations and understand our requirements in our lease today before we can talk about how we can address those challenges. Um, another financial potential benefit is check your lease. If you received a tenant improvement allowance or a TIA, that is money for the landlord when you built out that practice. Could be $5, $10, $40 per square foot. Depending on how the lease was structured and negotiated would define when it's being paid. Uh, I know there has been a few we've reviewed over the past few months where the landlord just didn't pay the final tranche or the last 10 or 20%. So for those of you looking under all the rocks for potential revenue, recall back, check with your office manager and to see that, yes, we did get paid the full $100,000, $50,000 from the landlord for the build-out costs. So again, in the, uh, in the financial components, right, I can't stress enough, do not stop paying rent. Rent is the, principally the first thing that triggers a default 
in your lease. So we want to be very cautious about what is in there and what happens if we're unable to make a rent payment because it can be catastrophic. It could be, as mentioned before, multiple months of rent due, right, within seven days of not receiving that. Right? We had a doctor reach out to us uh, not long ago, exactly that, was changing bank accounts. Right? This was a couple of months ago. The landlord never cashed the check on the first day of the month. Then as soon as the tenant had said, hey, I'm just switching banks, uh, I'm going to be adding a new practice, the landlord then, for the first time in 15 years, what did he do? Ran out to the bank on the first day of the month, knowing full well that that check was going to be switched and he had another check in his hand. Why? Because he was then able to, within seven days, charge and triple the security deposit, which was due seven days later. So be very cautious about um, and be very pragmatic to understand what happens if we get to the worst case scenario and a, and a payment is missed. Better, as Alan suggested, reach out to your lending partners, get a bridge loan, leverage some of the government's stimulus, but again, don't, uh, don't stop rent and make sure that anything that uh, concessions from the landlord has to be negotiated and be properly documented. So it can, want, it can require accelerated rent or a large deposit, uh, another core component that we might not even think of is that the second we're then uh, in default of the lease due to a lack of payment, we lose a lot of the benefits that we worked so hard to negotiate, either for you or that you might have done yourself. For example, exclusivity. Being the only dentist in the space or in your mall could be completely wiped away purely because of the fact that uh, you are in breach of your lease or in default of your lease. In addition to that, the options to renew, I'll give you an example uh, shortly in terms of what it would look like in your lease. But in most cases, if you plan or if you have a five-year term with two five-year options, right, very important now that your ability to stay in those space and exercise those options is purely to make sure that you're not in default of any components of the lease. Another component there is the financial statements. If you have signed the lease personally or have given a personal guarantee Many of you have a financial statement requirement in your leases, meaning that in the event of a default land or even not, the landlord could request your financial statements. And if you're personally signed it, they have the ability to go after your personal financial statements as well. So be aware of all these core components, the things we never really think of, but they can be most relevant. The assignment provision. Right? Let's say we have to sell our practice and sell our practice fast. Well, in most of your leases, the assignment provision, right? first of all, in the agreement of purchase and sale, usually is a specific clause that it's conditional on financing or the successful assignment of the lease. However, in the lease, so therefore you cannot sell your practice without the landlord giving you prior written consent. Therefore, right, if you are in breach, that landlord may uh, incompletely prevent you from assigning that lease or deny the transfer of that lease. It might seem counterintuitive, but they might prefer to go directly to that new tenant, start from scratch at a different rate, right? So there are a lot of components in there to be aware of. There could be termination rights that you may or may not be aware of, right, as a core component. Uh, I just saw a quick question here as we touch on, which is a good point, which is touching on the non-financial. So there was just a brief question come through about uh, what happens if the landlord closes the building? Well, if you're asking what happens if they go bankrupt or otherwise, then the lease will dictate what happens. In many cases, we'll touch on shortly is the subordination or non-disturbance agreement, which basically means that in your lease, you should have the ability that if, heaven forbid, the landlord goes bankrupt, your lease is subordinate underneath the requirements of the mortgage. So if the bank forecloses on your strip mall, right, very important that you have a subordination on disturbance agreement so that as you come out of phase two of this econ economic hardship, right, the, the new landlord cannot tear up your lease or take away your rights. Now, when we talk about non-financial, we've gotten a lot of questions on this, the force majeure. And in the essence of time, we won't bear on it too much. This is, you know, legal opinions, there has been all sorts of communication on this that no one's lease has thought to a pandemic. But a, a force majeure, if you will, 
is considered an unavoidable delay, right? Which is in principle describing where a particular covenant can't be performed by the landlord or in some cases the tenant, what happens then? What are the obligations, right? So therefore it's, it's, a key, it's a key component. There might be some benefit to you depending on how the lease was structured. Uh, but for the most part, it, it, and it does not impact the obligation to pay rent. So it is not a silver bullet by any means. And I'm sure the lawyers will spend years and years figuring out uh, different leases and specific to force majeure. And I'm sure that most new leases will now try to include pandemic under that as nobody saw this to this extent coming. So force majeure, again, is a core component to be aware of. Uh, that can be riots, that can be acts of God, those can be other elements, right? So there could be some relief to some of the performances, but most of the time it's, it's landlord friendly. And again, you still have to pay rent. Uh, okay, so now let's really cap off this. This is probably, as we look forward, some of the most important components of what we have. So on this screen, again, for many of you that are, uh, that are looking at three months or, or those of you that are calling in, we're looking at about 20 major clauses, critical business impacting clauses that uh, could be very, very impactful as of right now. So assignment, we already mentioned, if you are in breach or otherwise that could decrease or eliminate the ability to transfer the lease and therefore sell your practice. Uh, in addition, demolition. Right. Demolition now more than ever could be uh, a key contingent uh, if development projects change, if you know the landlord runs out of money, these type of things could be very, very relevant and uh, could be used as an opportunity to get you out of that space or if the landlord has to sell their building for pennies on the dollar, right? as we come out of phase two or phase three of this economic challenge, you're now going to have these big multinational corporations gobbling up these small little mom and pop stop shops. And before you know it, we may have high rises being put in place back to similar what we're seeing today. Uh, in addition, relocation rights, we touched on death and disability, very important. Uh, surrender. Right? What some of you might not realize is let's say we're to the end of our career, our production's been declining. And you know what? I This is just the, the the icing on the cake. I don't think I can sell. I want to give back the keys and I just want to walk away. Please make it stop. The surrender provision, also known as the restoration, depending on how it was negotiated or worded, may require you to return it to pre-dental condition. Meaning that whatever it looked like when you moved in, or if you assigned the lease, and took over the sins of the former doctor that negotiated or didn't negotiate, you may have a ten or $15,000 demolition fee coming from the landlord. Right? So from that perspective, critically important that you're aware of what these sections are. If you're not 100% if you're not aware, then doctors at the end, please click yes for a lease review. We have uh, cleared our skies to ensure that we're prioritizing the most urgent today. We've got additional staff uh, on the ready to help support and review your leases ASAP starting from today. Uh, overholding, I mentioned before, if you are month to month, please, please reach out. Um, the landlord may have the right to increase it by 150 or 200 percent, but what you might not realize is the landlord may also be able to go back and back bill you all the way back to when you were originally going month to month, right? So that is the holdover provision in your lease um, uh, or overholding. Personal guarantees. Again, if your corporation is unable to pay and you, like many, many, many other doctors, and it's very common for a new doctor to be required to have a personal guarantee, be aware because the landlord could leapfrog your corporation, right? Which is now in distress and go after you and your personal assets. So be aware of what your obligations are personally. And if you're not sure or not sure what exposure you have, please send us a copy of that lease. Operating costs, chargebacks, right? The landlord now presumably is going through a cash um, preservation exercise as well. Continuing operation is, a, is another question we get a lot of. So what happens if in your lease today, like many with Home Depot or otherwise, you have signed and agreed to a continual operation clause? 
That means that in the event that you're not open Monday through Friday, nine to six, and Saturday from nine to four, whatever that may be, staffed, lit, and operated, right? You could be in default of your lease. So now it goes through, well, was I required by law? Was I suggested? How long was I out? Most of the landlords have required the tenants to be stocked and lit. So continuous operations could be, right, uh, an avenue the landlord might use against us. Uh, quiet enjoyment we touched on, right? You, you have the right to have access to the space. If the landlord has restricted access to the space, then that is another interesting conversation point as we talk about how we can start to solve these challenges. So financial statements, termination rights, exclusivity, right? So here's an example, doctors, in front of you is the option clause, option to renew clause. Without going into this in detail, every red section is a section that should be negotiated or adjusted upon, right? Obligations under this lease shall not be uh, in default. So if you are in default, those options are null and void. Similar on the assignment provision. So here's what's found in 75% of the dental leases that we review and would be proportionate to those uh, on the phone. Uh, in addition to that, we then help to ensure that, again, if we are in breach of the lease, most landlords have the ability to refuse or use that as a reason to not assign the lease or allow you to assign the lease to a new tenant. So to the solution, right? this is most important. This slide is used at some of the largest national uh, landlord conferences. This is how they operate. Now, the current rule book is out the window. However, I would encourage all of you that if you are a lease is coming up for renewal, or even if it's not, the rule book goes out. But what typically occurs is you want the more time you have, the more leverage. So if you reach out to the landlord 24 months prior to your your lease expiring or to the option to renew deadline where you require to submit written notice if you choose to exercise your last five year option, right? Time is leverage. Most landlords will delay defer up until 12 months and then delay and defer to eight months and wait in many cases until after that option to renew deadline has passed and therefore you only have the, the right to stay in the space for the remaining six months. So now let's touch on next steps. So some core questions that we'll ask in the poll here momentarily is when does your lease expire, right? Is it in 12 months, 24 months, 36 months, et cetera, because the, your strategy will be very different depending on that fact. If you're coming up for renewal soon, right, then what a great phone conversation it is to say that, right, uh, I'm, I'm looking to renew, right, or I've retained Sears to help me because I need a new long-term lease with multiple term options and I want to dramatically revisit my financials as well as some of these clauses, right, which could have a significant impact on our business. So when does your lease expire? I would quickly flip through to confirm what that is. Also, when is my option to renew deadline? Do I have to give 12 months notice? Be aware of what that, put that in your calendar, have your office manager remind you that's key, right? What we are asking for now to the landlord community on behalf of our clients or otherwise is, Right? We're having the conversations about, look, our client is in dire straits. Right? Production has ceased. We've laid off staff. Right? It is critical that we receive rent release or deferral in, a in alignment with our ability to continue to be a great long-term tenant for the landlord. Many of you are the anchor tenant for the landlord. Right? You are most important in comparison to a rental car shop or a, a pizza pizza or a pizza hut or a barber shop, right? You represent their top tenant or one of their top tenants. So very reasonable to be structuring an adjustment. Maybe we defer a month rent and we add on one month at the end and we capture that in an addendum. Perhaps there's the opportunity of now asking for a three month deferral or rent holiday, right? To ensure that we're not responsible for those payments and those hit, hits to cash flow over the next 30, 60, 90 plus days. Additional rent. Now, while landlords are going to use the argument of saying, well, we have to pay taxes, we have to do these. If you're in one of the cities where there's a property tax deferment, perfect opportunity to also request or require a deferment or a delay or assistance or reduction in common area maintenance. Right? So, 
if you're asking yourself now, what do you do? Take action. Don't wait until April 1st when rent is due before thinking about what to do, right? For the you know hundreds of you on the line here, very important that um, you know, very important that we take action. First of all, you need to be aware of what your is in your lease today and before, right? And and not to just pick up the phone with the landlord and say, hey, let's do something. Let's figure out what your lease looks like, what your obligations are, what your concerns are. And I'm happy to personally, and all of you have my contact information, as well as info at seriousconsultinggroup.com. Send us a copy of the lease. And through morning, noon, and night, to the chagrin of my wife and toddler, right, you are my top priority because through the dental community, you've supported us so well over the years, and this is the least we can do to help support you. Have your lease professionally reviewed. Now, I know there's a lot of questions through there, and I want to get to that in a second. Let's touch on the glass being half full. So of the many, many clients that retained us recently, right, first of all, some of you are coming up for renewal soon. What an unbelievable opportunity you have now that landlords are increasingly nervous about what's going to happen over the 36, 90, 30, 60, 90 days for us to be able to engage in a conversation about renewing the lease, securing a new long-term lease, ideally a 10-year term with two five-year options, right? and being able to structure it in a way, in a non-binding way over the next 30, 60, or 90 days. Right? So there's the ability to help leverage the situation without obligating yourself contractually. Um, also now, resetting financials for new starts and also for renewals. Right, Landlords and the playbooks go out the window, especially for all those vacant properties. If you're looking at potentially looking for the reason to move practices or to eventually expand or otherwise, right, or if you're up at the end of your lease, talking to a few oral surgeons in the Midwest last night, Right? They're now being forced out of their space at the end of the year, and now they need to find a new space, ASAP, to make sure that they are never right, left without support and without a place to work, practice. Uh, new starts. What an unprecedented opportunity for three reasons. Number one, right, the Fed in the U.S. lowered the lowest overnight lending rate in our probably our lifetimes. We're almost 0%. Uh, similarly, in Canada and other parts of the world as well, where we have the lowest financing rates ever. Uh, equipment and supplies, many of our partners are on the line, right? Those of you thinking of expansions or looking for that opportunity to finally make that purchase, we will get through this, right? Definitely worthwhile reaching out to them to see if there's any additional incentives or, or benefits, uh, as I'm sure they're here to help support you to be ready and to be a key differentiator of a thriving practice, as we get out the tail end of this, right? Uh, specifically to that also landlords, right? Desperate to fill vacancies, uh, desperate. If they only have you for remaining three years of term, critical that they would love to recognize another 10 year of revenue by signing you up to a new lease. So there may be opportunities for those of you that are mid term to be able to have a conversation with the landlord uh, and maybe an opportunity to be revisiting reopening up the lease. Now, the landlord could say, no, take a hike. The landlord could say, no, but I'm, I'm willing to help in the short term. What does that look like? What would a proposal or draft proposal look like? Or number three, right, would be a, yeah, there's four years left on the lease. Uh, I would never have done under regular circumstances, but what do you propose uh, in a junction in, in alignment with potentially re-upping that lease agreement or renewing that lease agreement for a 10-year term, for example? Right. So from that perspective, again, before you pick up the phone and call the landlord, be sure that you know the data, know what rental rates are, right? know your data. We have 4.6 billion properties we're tracking, 9.5 billion square feet we're tracking throughout North America. Let us know. We're happy to provide a rent analysis for you. And then last but not least, tactics and strategies. We always get this question, how do I know you guys are going to get it? How do I know you guys are going to be successful in making some of these changes? Well, every negotiation is unique. But what I can tell you with our 12,000 successful negotiations and our recent over 100 all five-star Google reviews where we met and exceeded expectations, we followed this process. So number one, we gather all the documentation. Number one, right? Number two is we want to identify the practice and career goals for your practice. 
Number three, we want to review the office lease for risks, right? And find out what that is, which we'll have the option to request here momentarily. We then will do all the market research and then have a lengthy conversation about strategy, development, and what can we do in the short term and long term. In addition to that, that's, so after point five, doctor, that's when we reach out to the landlord. However, what do most doctors do, right? They, oh, my lease is coming due soon. I better pick up the phone and call the landlord and jump right into clause six and miss all of the background and the carefully choreographed game of chess, miss all of that moving forward. So we're going to get to some of these questions because we've just had another number of about nine or 10 come through. But after we negotiate all the business, financial, and the seven major financial components, we then go all through the business clauses through step seven, and then make sure that we get to a final form lease agreement that helps to protect us as much as possible uh, as we continue to move forward. So as we get to questions here, a lot of you have asked, how can you help? What can you do? So in appreciation of everyone's time for the uh, uh, almost 200 people that have joined and, uh, and registered here, we have... Uh, an appreciation of your time. So we're willing to spend a significant amount of time, a $1,500 value to our lease review, also known as a critical dates and risk analysis. So if any of this you're not sure of or not sure of what clauses you have in your lease, please email that to us as soon as possible to info at seriousconsultinggroup.com or click the poll button here momentarily, right? And we will prioritize those that are urgent or in a month to month situation or in significant financial hardship. Uh, we will do our best to get to as many of them as we can as quickly as possible, right? And, and doctors, as we approach the one hour mark, I wanted to, first of all, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we will continue to do these as often as possible. Please refer this uh, webinar to your friends. You will have a poll question that has just popped up for all of you. Please take a quick minute to update. Are you presently a tenant with the lease today? When does your current lease expire? Is your situation urgent? Question three. Uh, number four, are you interested in a complimentary lease review and rent rate analysis, right? And also, do you plan to build or start a practice in the next 12 or 24 months? Please take a quick moment, doctor. That will allow us to follow up with you individually. And also then, once you've completed that, you'll see all our contact information. Here's my direct office line. Uh, this, this links directly to, the, uh, to my uh, office line and write to me in the home office. So I'm happy to support you throughout this entire process. And, uh, and again, we'll get back to as many as possible, as quickly as possible. So again, we have a complimentary lease review. Strongly suggest that you take us uh, up on this and we're happy to assist in, in any way. Okay, so as everyone's updating those, uh, let me just touch base on uh, right now, so here's a great question uh, from a doctor that stated specifically about being the landlord's top tenant, right? And getting a feeling from the landlord that they don't care, right? And that smaller businesses or that the big box guys get all the, the blame or the benefit. So to answer your question, I mean, uh, Paul, specific to your question, it is, you know, the landlords or the broker community tend to right position you that hey if you don't want this space doctor i've got 12 other doctors that you know want to take this space over right but realize that your ability and the dentist's ability to get to the end of the initial 10-year term is over 90 percent meaning that 90 plus 95 uh, 90 plus percent of you will reach the end of your term without selling or transferring your lease or being in default right the the restaurant community it's almost the complete opposite the likelihood of a, of a restaurant being still in business 10 years later into that 10 year lease is almost the opposite, right? And it's less than 10%. So again, Paul, to your question, don't, don't let the landlord paint you with that brush, right? I get it. You're one tenant of many, many, you might be in and amongst the big box stores. And yes, of course, they're going to be top of mind. However, they're going to get through it, but your revenue is arguably just as important and Right, you represent one of the best possible tenants. You've got all the build out costs and beyond. So uh, thank you for those that are already sending through leases, someone coming through. Uh, another question here from Ben. Uh, what do you consider good rates for financing with the recent drop? So 
Uh, if you do have questions on financing, we received a great letter from some of our partners at Bank of America, as well as some of the Canadian banks. Uh, there, there are going through a unique stage where first and foremost, they're, they're almost immediately issuing lines of credit and support and credit facilities to help make sure that we get through this tough times. Uh, also, their credit departments are going through to figure out to how to dimension risk. So, Ben, I, I can't give you a specific rate or a number at this point. But obviously now, talking to many of them last week, right, that basically stated that in 2008, it was one of the best times as Bank of America, for example, was issuing loans and they were at incredible rates. There are some of the few banks that were lending and those doctors that took advantage were able to get unbelievably low construction costs, build out costs and beyond. So Ben, hopefully that gives you a couple of specific answers about sort of financing and, and rates. But to that point, right, if we can... If we can talk about negotiating the lease and helping on some of the financial obligations, especially those coming up for renewal, right, have, have less reliance on financing, more on this. So uh, a couple of other questions here, looking through, again, for those that are, are still curious, uh, if you're in the middle of purchasing a practice, should I continue or should I wait until everything is settled? So I agree with, with Ryan's perspective here is uh, we're going through a big element of uncertainty. If, if some of you are selling your practice on this line, I'm sure you're also thinking about, geez, what, what impact is this going to have? So we are seeing a bit of a shift from a principally a, a seller's market, both in the real estate as well as in the practice uh, world. Uh, and it's definitely worthwhile to, depending on the specific situation, depending on the practice, goodwill, et cetera, location, there's a large number of factors, but definitely it's worthwhile having the conversation of, the what if, right? And making sure that things are structured in a way that after you acquire the practice, you're not being in harm's way. So, you know, again, those that are building a new practice or potentially acquiring, right, there is great opportunities now if you're doing any renovations or deals or otherwise, right? As the economy starts to come back, as Alan mentioned slowly, you might be able to take some great advantage of that. Uh, another question from Robert. Uh, is it better to lease or buy in the long term? Yeah, million dollar question right now. So we're at the end of about 11 year bull market. And, you know, for those that own their own real estate, yes, they might feel okay that, hey, I, I don't have to pay my one pocket from the other. So be careful with that, right? From a finance or other perspective, you have to make sure that there's no tax implications if you're skipping paying yourself uh, rent or otherwise. But if you're asking, should I, should I buy or lease? That's probably worthwhile of a whole other webinar, uh, Robert, from that perspective. So, but definitely if you do own, you now have two irons in the fire. And with this unprecedented economy, if your practice is unable to produce, and therefore you also have a mortgage obligation, then you now have twice the concern and now two corporations in harm's way, not just one. So if, if I was advising a doctor that might be contemplating to buy a building and a practice today or to buy a building, I would definitely say that the lease should give a lot more flexibility than tying up all that capital to buy a half million or million dollar building. I certainly wouldn't. I would much prefer some of the flexibility of a lease rather than worried about, you know, if I have to sell my building now fast, what sort of a, of a decreased rate would I get for purchase price? And then now who's my landlord going to be? And now I've got to structure a lease because now I'm the tenant. So uh, hopefully that's helpful. Uh, Paul, thank you for your, your kind words. Uh, what if the landlords uh, aren't? Great question. Uh, I think we covered that a little bit earlier. Uh, uh, Mandy for three months lease abatement. So I'm not too sure of the question, Gary, but happy to circle back uh, individually. Um, and happy to, uh, to discuss as well. So the question now is about what if I'm subleasing? What if I have another doctor in my space? What if they can't pay rent? That is another challenge. Hopefully there's more than an arm shake, uh, than a handshake agreement between yourself and the subletting dentist in your space because now you are the landlord, right? But you're the sub landlord. You still have the full obligations to the head landlord. But now if your tenant can't pay, now you can't pay, you now have twice the obligation that you are now contractually committed to. So, um, and happy to discuss uh, further. And, you know, to, to your point, you've got a very unique situation. 
right? I would advise to make sure that you've got proper guidance on, rather than opening up the cans of worm, as you suggested, let's figure out the strategy, let's figure out where we sit with the subtenant, where we sit with the subtenancy agreement, and what your obligations are to the head landlord. That brings up a good point. Uh, if any of you are in a sublease agreement today, uh, very, very important. Uh, thank you, David, for just sending through your lease. Um, uh, emailing that to info at. Uh, but those of you that are in a subtenancy, hopefully you have received a copy of the head lease. Meaning, let's say you are leasing from a pharmacy, for example. Uh, you must know what the obligations are of the pharmacy. You might have a 10-year lease, sublease, with two five-year options. However, if the head lease from the whomever, right, physician or the pharmacy, if they are month to month, we've got a big problem because your sublease is only as good as the head lease. So again, any of you that are in a sublease situation and do not have a copy of the head lease, now is the time to ask, get a copy and send that over to us ASAP because you might be, um, you might be thinking you're protected and might be able to get through it. But if the, if the uh, leasee, the head leasee, the sub landlord is, uh, is in jeopardy, then that will have a cascading effect and would also invalidate your sub lease. So um, let me just touch base if there's any others. Uh, David had a great question here. So I've got 36 months on my lease right? Uh, what, what does that mean for me? So landlords have been aggressive. They've been pigeonholing me. I'm, I'm concerned. Well, a couple of questions there. First of all, David is, you know, 36 months typically is a little further than the usual, right? Renewal strategy. But the question now is how nervous is the landlord about other, right? Do they have any other buildings they own? Are there any other obligations? Right? What are the concerns that they may have and what can we do to protect ourselves from it? You might have a great opportunity to be talking about a new lease, even though you're 34 months out, uh, to help ensure that the landlord feels like there's a long-term solution or, or strategy here. So um, you sent a, a quite a detailed question there. Let me circle back with that one and definitely send us through a copy of the lease and one of the members of our team uh, will be happy to, to circle back. So uh, top tenant we touched on. I, I think those are the major questions. Let me see if there's any others. Uh, let me know here. Um, yeah, so Paul, good follow-up question. So big tenants in our building have shut down. So yeah, that is more leverage and concern to the landlord that if their anchor tenants are at risk or not paying rent, then to be able to shore up your lease Right, is going to be even more important. And the landlord might be that much more open to knowing that if the big guys are having concerns, I can only imagine that the coffee shops and others are going to have concerns. So, you know, you might be in a perfect situation of saying, look, I'm a professional, successful, you know, million dollar practice. You've, you can weather the storm. Now we can leverage the fact that the, the, the big boxes or otherwise are all closed as they are throughout most of North America. And you know, engage the landlord with the strategic conversation uh, about, you know, what does that mean for us and how can we get some, some help? Uh, okay, uh, I think there was just one or two more. We still have about 100 people here on the line, so happy to answer any additional questions. Uh, as most of you are finding your leases, you've got our email address, info at seriousconsultinggroup.com. Here's the, the office line. Uh, we'll call it the, the lease emergency helpline. Happy to pick those up. Uh, as well as Pushing Zero will get you to Carnell, our administrator today. We thank all the team for the support. Uh, another good question here that just came in. Um, I can move my practice. Looks like a death of a previous doctor. Unique situation to negotiate equipment and negotiate new terms and negotiate square footage. So I think the question here now is you're, you're looking to take advantage of a practice that has recently become available and acquire the equipment as well. If that's the question, Stephen, then, you know, some of the guidance I can say in the short term is, uh, I, I'm assured that whomever the landlord is today, if that previous business went under or if the previous uh, doctor's estate is looking to sell and sell quickly, 
I'm sure now positioning an acquisition in a new lease, uh, even though you might have negotiated whatever, 13, 14, $15 per square foot, uh, what we're seeing now is landlords uh, dramatically open to revisiting some of those previous financial terms. Now, it's not going to work in every case, but you've got a great story of saying, I'm going to take one of your vacant properties. I'm going to help solve right, the, the landlord's uh, mortgage problem by securing a long-term revenue. And what we've seen lately is landlords open to revisiting the financials, certainly a lot more than they were a month ago. So uh, happy to discuss your specific situation afterwards, Stephen, and, uh, and definitely send a copy through of that lease or letter of intent. Uh, definitely very important that that's negotiated. Arguably, the letter of intent is more important than the actual lease through the negotiation process. So what do I mean by that? In some cases, we spend more time negotiating that letter of intent, those two or three pages, which hopefully are not binding for you, Stephen, which gives you the flexibility to walk away by the time you see your lease. But we find more value in negotiating the letter of intents to put in all the dental specific language uh, and give those extra protections uh, and negotiate you know, a good portion of what we wanna see in the lease rather than waiting, engaging us after you've agreed to the letter of intent and now the landlords anchored themselves because they've already had their attorneys write the big long lease. So, for those of you that are looking at the opportunities at glass half full, then definitely happy to have a conversation. If you, even if you don't have a lease, still request a, uh, a conversation and consultation uh, that we're doing on a complimentary basis. Again, uh, waiving our fees for all those that are on the line for that review and helping to uh, support you from start to finish. Uh, good. Uh, any, any other questions? Because we still have about 100 on the line. We have some of our great partners on the line, uh, Andrea Chen from MNP. Uh, for those of you that are looking closely at cash flows and tax strategies and those type of things, uh, and you feel that you've been uh, under, perhaps supported from your uh, current uh, accounting team, uh, I would certainly suggest uh, that throughout North America, we have a lot of partners we've worked with. Uh, Andrea in the greater Toronto area is a great resource. It's done lots of lectures with me recently. Uh, certainly many of you, uh, lots of members here from some of the main um, uh, Henry Schein organization that are always great supporters. Use them, guys. You're not alone in any of this. Right? Jamie Imason, uh, obviously a lot of your clients are on the line as well. We appreciate all the continual support. Um, we are here for you, doctors. We appreciate all the support. We, we're here to help get you through it. And uh, I'm personally available for any and all of you as you see my contact information. Uh, and that note, uh, appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And uh, we will be having another one of these next Wednesday. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. I'll leave this up for another uh, minute or so for those who take a screenshot. Uh, happy to discuss. And thank you for all of those already. Looks like a few dozen leases already came through our inbox. So uh, looking forward to helping to support and having some great conversations. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Massam.